general review of uh, movement emergencies. Um, so this is uh, acute Parkinsonism. After um, chemo uh, therapy, he has got willing, as you could see there. Uh, so it right there on the on the way in, uh, and uh, of course uh, severe akinesia. Wiggle your fingers. Carlito, move your finger. So after a little bit of cinema, yeah, then he starts cinema. moving a little bit. Squeeze, squeeze hard, squeeze hard. We just have a patient in the hospital in the cancer center with exactly this. With a new chemotherapeutic regime. But as you can see, a residual Parkinsonism. Um, okay. Let's look at this. Um, so, abductor paralysis on the MSA. That's how Strider sounds. So you have multiple uh, levels of paresis. Uh, this is uh, some information from Japan, some videos from Japan. They're very good at MSA. You know, I mean, pretty plus science in uh, syndromes in general. So you see how the opening is incomplete. Uh, stage one. <coughs> away but the whole course are completely separated so it's, it's completely uh, it separates fully in between uh, air movements and that's exactly what they are saying right there in Japanese <laughs> But normally, you shouldn't see them all, all next to each other, you know, they should be very separated. And here we are gonna see, again, they're very close, but then at the very back, they are never separating fully. So all of that continues to get worse and worse and worse. And the, uh oh, getting phone calls from the hospital. At this stage, the patients are almost unable to breathe. Uh, uh, it is extremely uncomfortable. Danish, do you want to finish reviewing some while I answer this? Mm -hmm. If we start the chapter open, uh, or, so that's the, uh, you, you, you go on the top where it says select chapter, no, yeah, start video, chapter one, start video first, and then you go to select chapter, that's where you select them, so the, the, you saw yeah, the acute Parkinson's, the number seven is uh, the acute uh, dystonia, go right back. Brand fat gum don't live a lazy dog. Yeah. Good. Close your eyes. 
open, close, open, show me your teeth. Can you stick your tongue in and out? Stick your tongue in and out. Okay. Can you open your mouth wide, wide as you can? How's your jaw feel right now? Okay. How are you feeling right now? You're feeling a lot better. Speech is about a minute later. Can you repeat that sentence for me? Great. You saw how hypernasal this speech was almost like uh, uh, they call it hot potato sound. As if you're hot potato more than you, you're really burning, and you're freaking trying to do what to do with the with the potato. So it was probably because of uh, jaw opening the stomia. So they have a very effortful speech, and they really have to try to quench the teeth, but they still cannot do full articulation. Uh, remember when you're trying to assess the speech sound itself you have to divide it into phonation and articulation so phonation is what's happening in the larynx like what uh, Diego was showing earlier the closure or lack of closure of the vocal cords and that's where the phonation and, and back of your throat is being produced but the articulation is the movement of the tongue the jaw and the lips and any weakness there will produce a dysarthria, which is very different than dysphonia. And that's what you have to slowly start getting used to. So what he was having was dysarthria, where the articulation was not happening. So he was speaking as if he was trying to close the jaw, but the jaw is not closing. And it was making very effort. And then now the speech has improved off the receiving. So acute dystonic reaction, the most, what is the most common or classic acute dystonic reaction? Retrocolis. So, retrocolis is the most common and most acute association. It has a slight retrocolis. Initially, I was wondering if the camera was up high, the guy speaking to him is standing. That's why he's looking up a little bit. Uh, but I'm not so sure anymore. But that could still be the reason. Um, and uh, it may be that he has a segmental dystonia of the neck and jaw and lower face involvement. What's the most common cause of? Cute dystonic reaction. Medication for guessing it wasn't a specific one. It used to be metoclopramide up until five, ten years ago. Fortunately, has come down, uh, and now the dopamine blockers are the most common cause. Uh, the psychiatric antipsychotic medication, <coughs> Haldol, I think, is now the most common cause. It's still being used for agitation. Uh, with an acute dose and it's the acute exposure um, that causes acute dystonic reaction acute re-exposure is uh, also very important phenomena to remember so a lot of times the patients come into the ER after missing two days of medication intentionally or vomiting or throwing up being sick and the ER guys say let's start home medication and we give them the dopamine blocker the patient can have acute dystonic reaction what is uh, the second most common or let's say most important acute dystonic reaction to remember? Ocular crisis. Ocular crisis. So it's an acute ocular dystonia uh, and for some reason is classically associated with sense of fear. But I think even retrocolis has an associated fear with it if it's an acute dystonic reaction. Probably uh, fear because of dopamine blockers. Then I'm not sure, but it could be because of the limbic system. You know, you have a dopamine needed for outgoing personality, and obviously, suddenly withdrawn. The future maybe the fear is. He still has slur. You hear that? He has this lisp, and you know, we. Um, I think that's the most commonly missed abnormality in voice is that. Kind of a sound lisp, which is the weakness, uh, which is, um, I see it more with dystonia, but it is, uh, it can be from ataxia, it could be from tongue weakness. But a lot of time when I walk into the room and the patient starts talking, it's this kind of a sounds, they kind of, um, uh, they stretch, the Z's and S, 
but anything that requires articulation is being stretched. It's one of the most common things that gets missed. So this is dystonic storm, which is a status dystonicus is another name. It's like severe generalized dystonia. I'll show you a case where we admitted a patient who was in a dystonic storm. Very similar, a uh, patient in her 20s with history of cerebral palsy, dystonic cerebral palsy, and she was on um, baclofen pump for treatment of generalized dystonia, and that baclofen pump was uh, cut down more than half, uh, thinking that uh, she was having increasing dystonia and they thought it was because of the baclofen, so they cut it down and she had even worsening of dystonia and she was like, this neck was back like that, a pistatonis, a pretzel, like that. Uh, I, I have uh, videos in some of my lectures, or otherwise I'll show it to you. We admitted her for status dystonicus, so we generalized dystonic spasm going on continuously. She was in it for like six to eight weeks or something. Uh, and we treated her with IV, Benadryl, then Cogentin, Clonazepam, a lot of drug to try to break it. Is that a little bit of it? Yeah. Fortunately, the local drugstore. Okay, it's not a It's not a very good in Pakistan. Really? IV or oral? Both? Both. A very good drug? <laughs> yeah, it was like cheap and effective, but it's not available. We saw these malignant phonic text. Let's see that one. So there is a tick storm, similarly to dystonic storm, or you can call it status dystonicus. So there's a status for tick, tick status. Um, which is sometimes happen again it's usually either drug induced or drug withdrawal so we see one of these maybe every five years mm, fortunately and like failure where they see once a month once or a, a week day. or yeah <laughs> So they see a lot of these, uh, I think in part is because overuse of uh, antipsychotics. So you do that this morning. So there is a lot of uh, kind of concern about the use of uh, antipsychotics in, in our institution for ticks. Uh, because we have a feeling that they could induce what kind of things are you more malignant ticks. Tardive ticks and uh, uh, worsening of behaviors. Uh, we see a lot of patients with Tourette syndrome. Uh, uh, I think I see more than Danish and um, and Danish more than than the rest of the faculty. But uh, all I do with the ticks is get rid of the medication, and they slowly get better. So it's sort of a Habits or sort of a sort of a pain um, that that people uh, tend to uh, give more and more medications uh, to these kids, basically to just eliminate the medication. Okay, so this is a dystonic tick. Dystonic ticks are which posture is held for at least three seconds. Um, and of course, dystonic ticks like that need to be admitted so that we can treat them. And we treat them in the same way as dystonic storms. Uh, sometimes, uh, patients that have relatively mild ticks but that are fully incapacitated for by the ticks and need to be admitted so that we can start <laughs> treating them. Right now, 
because of these sounds, these noises. Um, so he's a math teacher. Uh, or something. We have not uh, been able to go in the public. Is that you cannot? So it must be very frustrating for you. No. <laughs> 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 you probably noticed that this was disturbing to others until his wife pointed it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it's very, 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 very problematic uh, condition. Now this one I'm not sure about. Anyways, a uh, few malignant funny things. We will review that uh, later. Um, and then let's just review Whipple's disease and we will call it a day. We will illustrate neuro-ophthalmic signs that are highly suggestive of Whipple's disease. When all three are present, it is pathognomonic for this condition. These are pendular vergence oscillations, rhythmical myoclonus, Vertical supranuclear ophthalmic bleeding. This particular thing, rhythmical myoclonus. Do you know anything else that can be called a rhythmical myoclonus? Palatal tremor? Yeah, so palatal tremor, uh, physiologically speaking, is a myoclonus, but it occurs in a rhythmical fashion, so it is you know, best described as rhythmical myoclonus. Another thing that is interesting is the, the classic tardive, the, the old term, all previously called classic tardive dyskinesias, which is the tongue movements, the tongue protrusion, and the, sleep, the uh, lips smacking and the like, also used to be called classical tardive dyskinesias, and now we are changing that more and more into tardive stereotypies um, as they seem to be stereotypical uh, movements. Um, they seem to uh, be able to hold them, they seem to be able to, you know, when they're talking, these movements go away, so, you know, they seem to be under full control of, of, uh, of the motor system. Uh, and therefore then uh, not involuntary but uh, uh, involuntary movements or semi-voluntary movements. Anyway, um, so you guys know vertic vertical supranuclear ophthalmoplegia, right? So you're unable to look upwards, but when you move the head then the eyes move. Mm -hmm. The pendular vergence oscillations, so you know what that is, uh, David? Uh, I don't know how to describe it off of the top. Okay. Um, it often goes with a jaw movement. Um, well, that's, that's more here. The first sign is pendular vergence oscillations, which are continuous, smooth, rhythmic, convergent eye movements with a frequency of 1 hertz, varying from 1 to 25 degrees of amplitude per eye. Pendular vergence oscillations by themselves are highly suggestive of Whipple's disease. They may be so subtle that extremely careful observation may be required. They may be asymmetrical. They may continue throughout sleep. They never diverge beyond the primary position. Divergence and convergence are at the same speed. They are not accompanied That's by why it's called pendular, not, not a mistake. Or accommodation. But the most important thing is that there is no myosis. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Because if there is myosis, then. It's a um, voluntary. It's voluntary and therefore it's psychogenic. Right. Yeah. 
very important. Uh, <coughs> on this, I usually just look at the nose and then get a feeling this for what the eyes are doing. Illustrates if you look at one eye versus the other, it's really hard. These pendular virgins oscillations can be. Sometimes, opening the eyes after forced closure may intensify the oscillations. That is something I have never seen. So there you go. Yeah. I could not see anything before. Beautiful. The second sign is Remington myoclonus and is characterized by a repetitive contraction of the facial, masticatory, and pharyngeal muscles, which may extend the limbs. This patient with Whipple's disease demonstrates bilateral, asymmetrical, facial, masticatory, pharyngeal, axial, and limb myoclonus. It is a lot slower than, than the typical myoclonus that you would see. So. Okay. Well, I guess that's it. Um, so we'll uh, we'll do another uh, roundabout for the chronic ones and uh, go from there. We're right in the middle of the presentation. So.